Um, I'd like to keep this casual, so if we have questions as we go along, that would be a good thing to have, to mix it up instead of just uh, my voice rolling out. Uh, the theme for the exhibition, as it turned out, was whatever I felt like doing for a year. Uh, usually I'll put a hard theme ahead of myself and then work toward that, have everything approach that theme orderly. Uh, and I decided that was maybe time to change that policy. So uh, I let the themes work themselves out in the third mind, to, to use a, a, a Brian Jison term, uh, where you're taking the information uh, consciously, uh, you're letting your subconscious process it, and you're letting the third mind do a better processing of it and then keeping yourself open enough to actually listen to your own voice as it floats back up to present the themes. So that's a convoluted way of how all of this happened. Um, another way of saying it is that I like magazines better than novels sometimes. So lots of different little subjects that are happening that may have something to do with one another. Uh, the title. Uh, the title are uh, two uh, neologisms to portmanteau words that I, I made up to describe this. The uh, molassesism is a slow, sweet study. And the anhygienic uh, is an unclean spirit. So painting is described as a very slow, sweet study of moving unclean spirits around so that they form something better, so that they may be produce, release uh, a more interesting spirit. Um, there are some themes that go through all of this. Uh, one that I'll start by pointing out uh, is the theme of the missing horse. Uh, sometimes things are horses, but they're not really horses. Uh, and they happen for a little while and they're gone. And in this show, uh, there are not really horses, but there are horses. Uh, if we start in the corner here, there's the saddle, but there's no horse on the little painting, Best the Beast. As we work our way around, uh, we have Joseph Butler. Uh, well, that is a horse, but it's just the bones. The basis of this painting was um, uh, reading about the history of grave robbing. And there was a particularly adept uh, grave robber who supplied medical schools with bones. Uh, his name was Joseph Butler. Uh, he was arrested around the 1790s uh, and sentenced to death for stealing mail uh, instead of grave robbing. Uh, but his sentence was commuted from death to excommunication because an aristocrat had a horse that perished and he wanted it articulated. And the best man for the job was on death row. So some talking was done in the back rooms and he saved his life. The horse uh, saved his life, so to speak. Um, as we come around, there's horseshoes, but again, no horse. Uh, coming through here, that's not a horse, that's a pantomime horse instead. Still not really a horse. Uh, coming back around, not a horse. No, that's a mule instead. The next painting over has horse hair in it, but still not a horse. Uh, and then finally the pieces on the table here. Uh, there's more horse hair with a missing horse and the uh, trappings. Uh, for a horse, but again, the horse is not there. Um, and painting is usually about something that isn't there, uh, unless we go with the uh, abstract pieces. There's a couple of which in here. Um, the one titled 1839. It started out as strictly black and white lines. But the recipes that I used to paint it and the process of gravity uh, changed it into something I think more interesting. Uh, taking 
uh, op art and making it into something a little more organic, uh, perhaps more friendly. Uh, some of these pieces are based on uh, photographs um, where I will combine different photographic references to compose the piece, like uh, Neglected Reputation, all of the trophies uh, taken together there. Um, even this uh, piece describing the taste, uh, the gray version of a watermelon, something uh, about painting that painting can approach but never really get there. Uh, it's always a step away from actually seizing its subject. Uh, other pieces uh, just came to me all at once and I, I worked through them. I had this, this opportunity to take the time and do that, like the, uh, the piece Dry Agued, uh, which is a, a tuba that's also a steak. Um, the Moths was a piece that instead of planning it out at length uh, came to me uh, rather quickly and was executed in just a matter of days. Uh, let's see, Mercurochrome Nurse Dance is uh, gold and dragon's blood uh, taken together on a panel. Uh, a different kind of a kind of mix. I tried to change the recipe for every piece that I was doing here. Uh, just to challenge myself to make it more difficult to approach the image making in different ways uh, instead of the same comfortable way. Um, to also provide uh, an example for students attending the show that there are many different ways of, uh, of approaching the, the image making. Uh, this piece uh, has no white paint in it. It's a painted brown background. But all of the uh, content in the front here is done by mixing varnish and powdered glass. The tiny little bubbles of glass in there that constitute the white instead of being white paint. This piece, uh, as we've described, is something about the painting experience, too, what we're all doing here. We're, we're, we've come to look at images for some reason. And in this case, he seems to be lecturing uh, something here. This may be about an astral body or some other subject which is undefined. Uh, and he's paused for a moment in his lecture to gather his thoughts or uh, to let what he's just said to sink in. Um, but again, it's, it's painting. It's at a remove. Uh, it's a as much about what we're reading into the image as what the image is uh, forcing out on us. Uh, this piece uh, was simply a dream, and I, I won't apologize for it any further than that. Some, sometimes the dreams are worth doing. Uh, the little one here, called Local Talent, uh, was an actual experience in the, uh, my backyard. I had brought home uh, to uh, clean it up and use it as a prop, perhaps. Uh, and while I had left it on the porch for a couple of months, bees, uh, wild bees had taken up and made a nest in the suitcase instead. This is all the stars in the world. And it's, uh, it's about to uh, the lowbrow, as well as the, you know, the higher aspirations that art should be. It's also quite interesting to me to, uh, just to have the experience of glowing stars something just that simple in, in accumulation. Uh, and that piece actually does glow in the dark. It's uh, made with, a, with luminous paint, as well as two or three others. The, 
uh, the piece back here that is the uh, uh, the temples in ruin entitled myth of the weekend uh, it's also painted with glow-in-the-dark paint the blue is powdered turquoise and everything else is iron filing Yes. Making of the potions and the paint um, as important to you as the image, or is the image unimportant? What what relationship does your to the science of art um, have? To it it depends on the piece. Sometimes the the idea of making another permutation, another mix. Uh, to see what's going to go on with this is the important thing uh, and the image is is uh, I won't say negligible but it's, it can be substituted that's not as important uh, and in others the image is so important that I switch back to some more traditional methods like this one what are the uh, the same as they were using 300 years ago. We've got Damar ground into uh, turpentine, making a liquid. You mix in linseed oil, powdered earth pigments. Um, nothing special beyond that, keeping it very standard. Uh, if, if the image is more important, and then sometimes it's just a balance. Uh, the moon's handkerchief trick. <laughs> yes. Yes, for that answer, it would probably be the mule, which I'm, I'm going to have to reference dreams again, and I apologize because it's something that's completely unprovable and I could be making it up but then if I actually did dream it I was also making it up so it, it just runs in circles but the mule I, I painted just as a standalone image because I had an old photograph of a mule that, that I cherished and I just wanted to, to honor him that way uh, and while doing this in a completely quiet environment the name came to me Lemuel Sprague so I started back referencing where do I get the name Lemuel Sprague from looking that up found no reference so that became the mule's title and then as the mule was getting completed there was a dream where Lemuel Sprague appeared in letters which rearranged themselves into Lemuel Prague so that's definitely the mule's name it was a, apparently a mule from Prague Lemuel Prague. Yes? Tell me about the sequence of how you went about this. Like, did you start with one and continue? Did you envision the whole thing? And there's a second part. Yes. How much was this driven by the framing and, and, and other apparatus that's, that's included? Okay, the sequence was the, the one thing that would have just made me mad <laughs> if, I, if I focused on it. Um, I had to go just from one to the other. Uh, I just, I left off a, a kind of an agenda, a list. I know so many lists I made of this stuff. Can't follow the list. I just had to go by whims and finish the work that way in order to get everything done. Uh, instead of any kind of a sequence, if any answer is valid for that, it would be the dry assemblage pieces that are on the table here just because I knew that in doing those pieces there's no drawing time there's no waiting time once they're done they're done so those I saved until the last I actually finished the last one uh, the morning that the show opened that evening and as far as framing uh, it, it goes back and forth with those sometimes the, the frame will come first and it, absolutely has to be one image alone. Uh, other times the frame will just hang up there for decades till I find just the right thing to use for it. Like the case with the uh, feathers, the last breath. 
that case just sat around for a long time before it just suddenly occurred to me. It needs to be full of feathers and reference suffocation. That was time. Suffocation. Yes, Paul. The bed on this paper. Yes. I think I've seen it before. Uh, there were blood spatters on the wall above it. And I don't remember if it was Department of Physiatrics or Breeding Grounds or if it was the house. So there was a, you did a wrought iron bed. And yes. And these blood spatters that went around two, two walls. Yes. Is that the same bed? You it's not the same bed. It's a similar bed. And it's probably a similar angle, too. Uh, but instead of making this one, that one is, is like an obvious tragedy. Uh, and a relation between the, the, the care of making a painting and the, the anger this of causing the tragedy. They all took off their shoes, got into bed, and where they going? Yes, yes. Well, that's, that's le that I left open. It's a procession. Is it a procession of one person? Is it multiple people? Is it those who were conceived on there? Uh, those who departed on there? It's their procession, and all we're left with is their various styles of shoes underneath, with the bed that's still perfectly clean. Yes? I don't think so. I think that was a different blue. Uh, yes, that one is a, there was a very old image that I had of uh, someone fording a river on foot. Uh, and I thought maybe this should, should instead reflect the idea of changing a career path. So here this, this gentleman is fording the river. We think he's going to make it across. At the same time, he's carrying a bicycle with him. So he wasn't prepared for this, but he's doing it anyhow. <laughs> and there'll perhaps be a different road once he gets on the other side of the river. And I think it's, I think it's a different blue because one of the rules that I tried to follow for this exhibition was once I had used a particular color uh, to set it aside and not use it again. Um, where I could maximize the variety. I have, having said that, it's still a very limited palette, too. Another question. Yes. Is the surface of the crystal, you said you use nine different or 14 different crystalline substances in here? Or something like that? Red oh, the resins? The resins are probably closer to 20. Oh, of, of, no, of the soft resins. Minerals. Mineral. You want to know about minerals. There's one. There's one mineral, mica. Well, the mica can be seen in a flaky form here, applied on top of the painting. Uh, the mica is in a thicker form here, applied as a mosaic between uh, a background painting and the content on top of it. Uh, then there's a third mica in the glass piece there where the mica is dipped into the uh, varnish and powdered glass mixture and applied kind of like a glue uh, to build up that fountain image. So it's the same, the same mica, just in, uh, in three different kind of qualities, used in three different ways. Yes. On, on every one of these, it's just the DeMar varnish. DeMar varnish. Yes. Just the simple varnish. Uh, I have learned what doesn't work is to use any type of a varnish that's soluble in alcohol. Now, I've used those in many of the pieces in here, but for some reason, uh, anything that's alcohol soluble, once it dries, the mica is just going to flake away from it again. You want it here. The Damar, it'll stick all day. Yeah. Isn't it nice? Thank you. Oh, the, the, the pantomime horse. The plot device. He trots out when he's necessary. This. Uh, this piece is part of an ongoing series in um, uh, depicting 
objects that are falling out of favor, that are being disused. Uh, so you have things like this horse, you have the, uh, the, the British judicial wigs, those sort of things that are gradually fading into disuse. Um, you know, the idea of even coming close to having an analog telephone in the show, which I may do at some point, because it's part of the same thing. Uh, these kind of objects that we recognize, but we're recognizing them as something unused, rather than as a symbol for something else. The, uh, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. The, the books being turned around just, just uh, reflect on, well, the title is Acumen. So it's, it's the kind of information that we carry with us that's not immediately referenced, but it's, it's still there. It's this uh, kind of a backlog that we don't um, think of as a ready reference, yet we know it anyhow. We, we know what the Jetsons' dog was named. That. Well, it might be. It, it might be. Uh, the case is filled with some 80-year-old uh, feather pillows. Oh, not a mice. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope mice didn't get into that. I filtered it first. But uh, yeah, the, the chickens that perished for that, that was about 80, 90 years ago. No, it's not pleasant at all in there. I, I might have to. It'll settle. You can turn it upside down every time. Yeah. yeah. Well, a piece that does change, uh, body, mind, and spirit. Uh, and this one was made to deliberately fall apart. The, uh, the body is the painting itself, in reference. The mind was that the surface was uh, painted as a diploma when it was fresh. But it was made with a recipe that would cause this to happen in a matter of days. And then the spirit is what catches everything as it falls apart. It's, it's kind of a, of, a, of a stress relief against paintings that had to be perfectly done that uh, couldn't be scratched on the surface, and here's one that's made to very deliberately come apart. I think it'll just keep dripping as long as we leave it hanging there. Oh, this one glows in the dark too, I forgot. Another one. That's, uh, yeah, it's finitude. It's, it's a window that's useless until we turn out the lights. Now, let's see. And the, the hair on this piece uh, is, is a visual reference to the old instruments that are coming unstrung and falling apart. And it's also a, a, a painter's reference to, to having wet surfaces that hair gets into where it can't be. And, and it's, extremely difficult to pull little hairs back out of a painting. So I, I kind of put all the spirit of hair sticking in painting here, where it would maybe exhaust itself and deliberately pile it in there. Um, that's kind of, oh, the little guy in the corner. I commented on him. Uh, this is Br'er Thulu. Uh, in, in putting together the show, reading lots of different material for inspiration, I reread uh, the Uncle Remus books. Uh, and, you know, of course there are, there are egregious elements in those now, and there are also innocent and worthwhile stories in there too. So, how do we separate these two? And then I crossed that up with some H.P. Lovecraft and thought that if the Thulu went into the Uncle Remus world, then he could be the focus of, of everything bad that we associate there, uh, leaving the other characters just to, to give us a more wholesome uh, story. Oh, and he glows in the dark too, yeah. Yeah, parts, uh, bits of him do. 
Yes. Funeral photographs, yeah. Definitely there's, there's a memorial aspect to a lot of these. Like, uh, um, sometimes it's more obvious when things are, are uh, left as bones, like the dodo bones uh, back there. And then other times more, just more obscure or personal, like the uh, typewriter image back there, which to us is, is something almost a non sequitur, to have floral memorial on a typewriter, but I actually saw that hundreds of times in Thailand because I was there at the time when they were honoring the inventor of the Thai typewriter. So you would frequently go to places and there would be vintage typewriters with flowers piled on them because that was a step toward modernity. So another, another kind of memorial for something that may not uh, even be a valid aspect here. That's the sacred piece. <laughs> don't, don't tell anyone it's up there. That's, that was the first piece to go in the show. Uh, it, and, and again referencing the title, it uh, pulls the bad spirits up there from anything that's going on in, in the reading or experiencing of the show. Uh, and it captures those uh, to keep them out of our way. And it's made entirely of family doilies. Is it people in your family made? Yes, it's all handmade. Doilies. So it's a lace work. Yes, like crochet. I don't know what you call that uh, toy looking. Yes. Uh, the surface, the physical surface is really amazing. The, the background surface and the inside the animal surface is really different. So yes. What kind of medium did you use? That is using uh, several different mediums that aren't supposed to be used together. <laughs> okay. Because they, they give you this, this kind of vice that happens on the surface. A right. uh, good many years ago, in studying art and, and the way that painters use materials. Um, I was frustrated because it wasn't, there weren't enough options. So I began studying uh, paint technology and surface coatings, the way that uh, automobile industry would use paint. And they have to have it right every time. And the faults are terrible to them, but the faults are interesting if you're an artist. So this kind of reading uh, gave me lots of notes about how to make paint. Uh, they had a lot of problems, and that was one way of doing it. You're, uh, you're taking some, those are non-traditional kind of oils you don't usually use in art painting mm -hmm. uh, with some very strong solvents uh, that you're not supposed to breathe, <laughs> and working them together outside, and they give you this kind of effect. Uh, and then you can, you can work over that uh, and make it even more interesting. There was, there was this, a chemical crisis that occurred on the surface there. So, so do you keep the recipe for that? Do yes. Do? I keep it in a safe. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Yes. We're going to see cars yeah. coming out with that texture. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, I think they own it more than I do, so that's fine. That would be a nice project. Yeah. <laughs> Not... Not all of them. I made probably 80% of the frames in here myself. A few of them were antique frames. Uh, a couple of them were custom made just to have an, a different kind of molding. Um, almost nothing is duplicated in here in terms of the frames too. Even a, a similar molding is treated differently too uh, where I could add to the variety. Uh, yeah, and a lot of these are made after the frame, like the round piece with the moths. 
wasn't even conceived until I obtained the frame. And then that was the right subject for it. So was the bird you, until you obtained or until you made the frame? That one I obtained. Actually, it was Craigslist. It was five minutes from where I lived. It was cheap. So it was, you know, it was kismet. Yeah, it had to happen. Oh, Scrygrai. Scrygrai, uh, another uh, neologism for, for collecting the smallest amounts. Um, that piece is working with the doll in the ceiling there to, uh, to help collect yeah, any, any, kind of, any kind of negativity, any, anything bad uh, that's going on in the space for this show. Uh, and we made all of those little uh, coils to catch this into pure beeswax. I say we because fortunately in this museum's program we're provided with an intern who was, a, they sent me up, a very talented intern who was able to work on a lot of different things. So I treated it both as a help and a teaching opportunity. Have a lot of different materials for them to work with. There's a whole stack of them. Oh yes, goodness yes. There was the uh, there's the stamp collector. There was the the lady that owns the moon as a pie. Uh, there was the clown. There was a lot of yeah, a lot of things. But and I was even concerned there wasn't enough in here up to like the day we hung it. Seriously, but uh, it, it turned out okay. Yeah, there's there's always the next show. I. It bothered me that I couldn't get those in here until I recategorized them into a different theme. And now it's okay that they'll be done later, which is just me tricking myself. No, 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 it's, it's very positive because she, uh, she's much more technical minded than I am. Uh, and it's a different perspective. That, that was all, all a positive experience. I have Robin to thank for picking out the color because we went, we went to a, a paint store, which didn't give me free paint, so I won't say their name, and we, we picked out the perfect color for this. Uh, Making the walls this color was my way initially of dealing with a large space. Instead of just making larger work, because it's a larger room than I'm accustomed to, uh, I wanted to reduce this instead to a more, more to me, a more human level. Uh, to move this down, make it look uh, something more like it's commonly found in uh, natural history museums or local history museums. Um, where the, the items are kept kind of in a hushed, quiet area with a lot of variety that's pulled together through some particular scheme. Uh, so I'd rather have it that kind of look than uh, just a standard museum installation. And, and a color that, that begins the palette for the entire show as well. And I, well, I knew the things that I do would be a, a smaller scale and this would bring it down. Which, which I could fight against by jamming them close together too. 
we're proud to say that Eric and I took three hours to hang this show. Three hours from the floor to the wall. And you, did you know the order that they would go in before you came up? Sort of. Sort of. We weren't sure, but we. Yes. Did the ankle. Thank you. you. You looked at the wall as a painting and you said the way that you would have painted. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, the objects I just called as a group uh, vestigial speciation, which uh, I may be wrong, but I th think that refers to something useless, useless in an organism that's left over at the same time it's the beginning of something new. So something new out of something useless. Uh, and one of the criteria for these uh, was that they be all ruined materials. Uh, a little, it, it, I found it difficult for a year to collect uh, useless ruined leather uh, because that's the kind of thing that no one saves except me. But uh, I, I managed to uh, collect enough leathers to do this. I had a friend of mine send horse hair from West Virginia uh, to complete this little guy. Um, and if we're talking, this is actually um, hide glue in a useless form. And the dome is rubber cement in water. No, 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 no. Uh, and everything else is just uh, useless bits that were, were put together in a povera uh, uh, kind of way. It, it's also a, a relief to work on these pieces as opposed to those that took so much precise detail to do. Uh, it's kind of a, a treat that I save for myself uh, to relax from that. This one, I, I, I took it as like a, a reminder to myself that uh, you know, having done something in the past and, and not paying enough attention to it, it gets tarnished. So there are all these trophies that are being shadowed and tarnished and neglected, except a little bit of shininess remains, uh, just to draw attention. Fa my favorite were these guys. Were well, these guys because they were they were tactile. They were interesting to work with. They were non-demanding. You know, they were visceral. They were, and if they were ruined, it, zero, zero cost, just gone. And a lot of the leather did just crumble away as I was, I was making these. Oh, well, these are, these are the Nephilim, which may be considered angels, but they're not necessarily protective or uh, the best of angels. They're like angels that have jobs to do, uh, whether, whether they're, they're pleasant or not. Uh, but then again, no, it isn't. It's just children with uh, pillows, having a pillow fight but it's kept kind of in between so that if you look at it uh, in a certain way it might be the angels instead um, and that piece is done just with white paint and powdered graphite rubbed on the surface and burnished
I'll be glad to answer questions at length for anyone. And thank you all for coming tonight.